My thanks to David and Tom Beers and NABE for including me on this very distinguished panel. And my special thanks to the 75 or so of you who have stuck with uh, this much Zoom this late in the session, this late on a Friday. Uh, my brief is to talk about globalization and the economic outlook, and in particular, how the US withdrawal from the global economy is affecting that growth. I uh, am bringing up some issues a few of you have heard me talk about before, but I think it's important to drive home some facts and also to raise in light of things like Eric Rosengren said, what are some of the international aspects that are not just about other countries in the US, but the international effects on growth. So let's see, here we are. Share. Oh. So what I want to talk about is how globalization proceeds when the US retreats and the implications for global growth. Now, I feel like I have to drag this in every time. Globalization is about more than stuff you can drop on your foot or stuff you can eat. And we see again, and we've seen it in President Biden as well as President Trump's discussions and throughout the press and world, perception is on men doing heavy things with heavy stuff, preferably dangerous. So concrete, steel, autos, fishing. And even economists, when we talk about globalization, we tend to focus excessively on issues of trade and global value chains, and in particular, manufacturing. Now, colleagues of mine at Peterson Institute, notably Chad Bown and Mary Lovely, among others, have done really great work on global value chains. And obviously, there's a political salience argument for focusing on manufacturing. But the bottom line is what globalization means for growth is, and therefore for a first approximation of economic well being, is very different than this focus. In particular, globalization, I have argued, should be thought of as a multi layered web of connections. That trade in goods is just a small part, and in fact, it may actually be the most resilient. We all know that blockades and sanctions generally are gotten around, that when people want goods, it somehow gets there. What is much more vulnerable and also much more important for growth is the flow of investment, of services, of human capital, ideas, basically networks, and different forms of infrastructure and norms. And when these get broken up or interfered with, the effects on productivity growth, on innovation, on entrepreneurship are very material. And so economic openness is primarily about the beneficial effects it has on your own society and on reducing conflicts between nations. It's not about opening up markets of others. Now, again, for this audience at the ASSA, I hope that's not a shocking statement, but you should be shocked how much those of us in Washington have to keep trying to explain this. So in my view, globalization has been corroding for the last 15 plus years, and particularly because of the US. And I choose the term corroding because it's not about is it expanding or shrinking, something simple like that. It's about a fraying more and even that some places the bonds are still there. In some places, one layer is there, but other layers are not. But we also see expansion of say trade with CPTPP or the EU. So it is a mixed bag. But one of the things that the US used to provide was some evenness of globalization and multi-layering of globalization, particularly to the benefit of developing countries. And so what I've termed the post-American world economy is increasing that unevenness. And this to me is a two-way cycle with declining macroeconomic performance. Sebastian Edwards wrote some classic work a while back on populism. We all know that there's some positive connection between bad economic performance, particularly for entrenched incumbents and populism, and then between populism and bad macroeconomic performance. So if we think about political constraints on what keeps the US from doing constructive international economic policy making, we obviously have a divided electorate, divided Congress. We have had for now the last several years, a bipartisan fear that I think is excessive from Chinese development. I'm not making a national security claim saying there's no threat from China. I am not making a human rights claim saying there are no abuses of human rights in China. I am merely saying on the economic side, 
there is an excessive sense of fear that what is good for the Chinese economy is harmful to the US and harmful to the West. Of course, there's all the usual special interest lobbying. And I think importantly, having watched my state senator be stuck for 27 hours on Interstate 95 the other day in the midst of a four inch, five, six inch snowstorm, uh, is the loss of reputational soft power in the US. The, the US has in its own way shown its self-harming responses to COVID, to the January 6th insurrection. This is all making the US less and less a constructive player. And so we have a legacy now of obviously very aggressively anti-globalization Trump administration policies, but in the majority of cases, Biden administration willingly or unwillingly continuing them. Uh, tariffs and other measures in place, the Biden administration has continued. Rhetorical escalation versus China, the Biden administration has arguably increased it. Um, distrust abroad of the ability of the U.S. to commit, I think, has been reduced for good reason. The diplomacy of the Biden administration is an approach to allies is more constructive than that of the Trump administration. We've had the politicization and diminution of U.S. civil service, the U.S. administrative capacity. And that, again, has been improved a little under the Biden administration. And then we have executive orders partially protected by the courts. And these, for the most part, have been continued. There was some hope that Biden would reverse many of these. But partly it's that the court system in the US is going to make it hard for him to do so. And partly because of all the right wing judges that have been appointed, but partly because on things like immigration, the Biden administration doesn't want to change things. So it's worth remembering that the usual simple-minded income inequality goes up as trade goes up is incorrect. If we just look at a simple time series of uh, the development of how well the various quintiles of income did in the US, the biggest increase in inequality took place, of course, in the 80s with the deregulation wave, the tax cuts of the Reagan era, which were accompanied by extremely protectionist policies, including talking down the dollar, including voluntary export restraints, and so on. Um, and so even after what is normally referred to as the China shock from 99 to 2005, the increase in the top quintile share of income actually was a much smaller one than in the preceding decades. Um, these are all charts done with colleagues at the Peterson Institute, and they're all publicly available. The data is there for, for, for replication. Um, the U.S. share of labor in national income, I realize there's a lot of good work out there trying to determine how best to measure this, but on what seems to be the, the best measures for the Penn World Table, um, it's been broadly flat, again, since the Reagan period and declined more in other countries that were more open. Um, and so what we can see is that the trade openness of the U.S. has not kept up with the world that unlike the story of unremitting liberalization and openness that's sometimes told, most other economies around the world have been opening up in terms of trade and goods and services, while the US has basically not and has flattened out. Uh, this is not just a China effect or something else. If you look at the other large open advanced, large advanced economies and democracies, what you see is that they all pretty steadily increase their globalization. Even Australia and Japan did on this score, uh, whereas the US continued to lag behind. Um, foreign and direct investment has stagnated into the US since 2000. There is, unfortunately, for reasons I've never understood, a period in which the US BEA stopped collecting data in the early 2000s, but anyway, is our nominal numbers, the real share of GDP and the real share of global foreign direct investment has been going down. Um, and of course, uh, immigration population growth has been slowing for decades in the US, going way back to at least 2000. Uh, obviously, the Trump administration was particularly cruel in some of the ways that they resisted immigration, and the Biden administration has not reversed that as much as they should have. But in the end, we have immigration going down, down, down. And that is true now, again, worse in the US than in other countries. Even Japan, even Germany have seen 
quite substantial increases in their rate of growth rate of immigration. Again, levels of previous accumulated, obviously the US is still ahead. And finally, just to point out, going back to my theme of we should look at globalization as more than just heavy men doing heavy stuff, um, manufacturing employment has been declining even in Japan and Germany for the last 30 years. Um, as my colleague Robert Lawrence, among others, has pointed out, this looks awful lot like technological change, not some trade issue. You don't see a sudden break in 1997 or 99 to do with China's entry into the WTO. You don't see that the countries that had different bilateral trade balances having different experiences of manufacturing. We're all just declining at the end from different starting levels. And just to do a very simple-minded, but I think powerful difference in difference, we picked up uh, numbers on Nordrhein-Westfalen, which is the basically the Ohio of Germany, is the Rust Belt of Germany, was always the heavy industry part of Western Germany or one of the key states. Um, and it has seen a decline in manufacturing employment, essentially equivalent or even larger to that of Ohio, despite Germany running an ongoing trade balance. All right, so going through all this is just to say that the withdrawal of the US from globalization is significant. It's multidimensional. This does not document the cultural and political aspects, the turn against Chinese and foreign students, the um, barriers to cultural trade, lots of non-tariff barriers that have been put in place, the Buy American programs, the failure to extend into um, TPP or to any other trade deals, the fact that USMCA is essentially NAFTA 0.8 rather than NAFTA 2.0, it further restricts trade. On and on and on, we have seen a bipartisan across multiple administrations withdrawal of the US globalization, which happens to coincide with a period of declining productivity growth. I'm not going to suggest that those two are directly causally connected, but it certainly didn't help. What does this mean for growth going forward? So if we think about the medium term, by which I mean the two to five year outlook for drivers of global growth, I think what we're seeing is going to see over the next few years is a regionalization. Now, people have been speaking about, I'm old now, people have been speaking about the world dividing into economic blocks my entire career. Before I was a grown up, they spoke about Europe and the American challenge in the 70s and mid to the 80s. We again spoke about Europe versus the Soviet Union, and then of course Japan. The Japan worry persisted, Europe came back, and then of course China. The stop clock is occasionally right for obvious geopolitical reasons. Um, doesn't mean inevitably, but because of the situation we are now in, I do think we're going to see increasing bifurcation, divergence between US and China. And then we have COVID, which leads to greater regionalization of productions, including services, because you're going to want to have more and more control, trust, perceived trust, and reliability. So what we're going to see is in the short term, some boost in growth in the sense that we're going to get a near-term increase in business investment to build redundancy. I'm going to want a supply chain that does not go through China. I'm going to want a supply chain that does allow me to domestically produce personal protective equipment. But in the medium term, the decrease on returns in these investments will be significant because these are essentially you're buying insurance or you're buying redundancy. That may be economically rational and it's probably overdone for political reasons, but you're just reducing economies of scale. You're also going to see, I think, a world, again, going back to the theme of multidimensional globalization, divergence of standards, technological standards, of course, but also standards of accreditation, of financial accounting, and so on. I mean, we're seeing this experiment, obviously, with Brexit, but I think you're going to increasingly see it between China and the US, and then potentially countries lining up with those. Now, you can, of course, and people have for decades, exported to do business with other 
countries with other systems, but it is a transaction cost, a non-trivial one in some cases. Uh, it reduces the amount of trade and services. And also there is an additional regulatory burden and risk of politicized changes to rules. I think in the end, this is going to decrease gains from innovation because it's going to make it more difficult for different forms of innovation to spread and be widely adopted. And it's also going to mean that as technologies diverge, it will be less able uh, to bring the technology from one place of innovation to another. Now, of course, this could be exacerbated by national security tensions, which make it so that Chinese or Americans want to be sure the other doesn't have technology. Now, one possibly good thing coming out of this situation would be increased government investment in and protection of national champions. And there were some people who I know well who heading into the Biden administration were talking about, well, you know, like with Eisenhower and Kennedy, we can use the space, who using the space race, we can use the Chinese challenge to get good investment in our and so, of course, some amount of R&D and infrastructure investment will be positive for growth. But we also have to recognize that the more you do things for national security competition reasons, the more you end up protecting the national champions. And that diminished competition is going to be negative for growth. Now, green investment under low interest rate conditions could go either way. We could see this, this being a framework under which we are able to get more good fiscal use of investment for green purposes, which of course I would support. It's also possible as we're seeing now with the Biden administration's attempt to make electric vehicle production a US only thing that we will end up having fragmentation of technologies, lack of scale and lack of competition impeding the benefits of the green investment. I think, um, this is not my area of study, but I think diminished labor mobility across borders and perhaps even inside economic blocks is going to be a side effect of this. And this relates in spirit to some of the last part of Sebastian's presentation, as well as some issues Carmen touched on, that you know, this, the, this has very major implications fiscally for countries receiving remittances, but also fiscally for advanced older economies who tend to benefit from having migrants and migrant labor. Um, this could potentially also raise the NARU because we end up as we're seeing now in the US and the UK, if you don't allow migrants in or you have many fewer migrants in, you end up with shorter term labor shortages and mismatch. So what does this mean for the pattern of growth going forward the next few years? I think, and this again, picks up on some things that Carmen and Sebastian were talking about, and that the IMF and World Bank have done a lot of work on. We, we, we all know, or at least should know, how terribly awful two-tier the post-COVID recovery has been for low and medium income economies left out of vaccination, short of public health equipment, uh, being shut down from tourism and from remittances of traveling workers. But I think behind all this and the COVID response reinforces the broader trend is that there's more risk of low middle income economies being left behind instead of converging. I think more uneven globalization, as I mentioned up front, and as I argued in foreign affairs a few years ago, means de facto more hurdles to getting FDI in and exporting out from developing economies. It's just gonna be more politicization and barriers. And division into geopolitical blocks on the average will mean pressures to choose. This is very graphic. Right now, we've seen the, the, the various pressures China has put on Lithuania and other countries that are nice to Taiwan. We've seen the uh, tr retaliatory trade measures that the um, Chinese put on Australia and South Korea at various points in recent years. But at the same time, we've seen the US go into places like Argentina and say, we'll give you money or we'll help the IMF give you money, but only if you don't take Chinese money. This is not a good outcome. This is not a good outcome in human terms. It's not a great outcome in foreign policy terms. And it's definitely not good for growth. I think the emphasis increasing, even if understandable after COVID, 
and the supply chain issues among the rich countries. Talk about nationalism and self-reliance will make it still more difficult for developing countries to compete. It, it, it is possible um, that, you know, in, in a more enlightened, slightly world, uh, Mexico and Canada and some Latin American countries would benefit from the U.S. reshoring because it would be near shoring or friend shoring rather than literal reshoring. Similarly, Eastern Europe might benefit. Similarly, certain economies near China might benefit. But these are going to be primarily middle income economies that are already integrated with the, with the large economies. And these are, and they will be forced to choose. Um, I also think, and this is just a realistic forecast, not something I'm happy about, but you know, we've already seen uh, much of stalling of multilateral institutions, notably the WTO, but others. And I think the, the resort in this kind of world, as with CPTPP, is the plurilateralism, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I think it was the right thing for Japan and Australia and others to create CPTPP without the US. But in the end, that will reduce the consideration of the interests of small, global, medium income economies the way multilaterals do. Now, in this game, one can imagine some opportunities for small and medium economies to play blocks off against each other. I think the higher income East and Southeast and Asian, Southeast Asian economies, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, um, and others will, Taiwan was a very big exception, um, will have the most room to play. It, it's going to be entirely credible that South Korea or Japan does not want the compromise of security to Japan, but it's also entirely credible that they cannot completely decouple from China no matter what the US politics wants. Um, the EU may have some opportunities as well to play off. Uh, obviously, there's the whole Airbus and certain kinds of nuclear plants that if the US is kept out, the EU gets in. But I think this will increasingly be offset by geopolitical pressures to play along. There are economies we know that will have uh, unique or nearly or rare natural resources um, or locations, which then will also be able to perhaps get a bidding war. But we know that that's not a real model for ongoing growth. I, so I think an implication is that Chinese and US trend growth rates are going to decline further than currently projected from demographic and longer term tech trends, because they're both going to become more self-reliant, more closed, uh, more wasteful of investment funds. I think what's interesting and I haven't yet thought through and would be interesting discussion of is I think that there is a risk that savings become increasingly trapped at home or in a given block, that Chinese savings already are limited in where they can flow out. US is starting to talk about putting restrictions on foreign companies and foreign investment and encouraging reshoring. Now, the macro effects of this are not clear. It should, in theory, perhaps reduce returns. Um, on the other hand, in the US, if you didn't have a savings glut coming in from the rest of the world, interest rates might rise. I think this bears further investigation. Now, some international cooperation is attainable. I don't want to suggest that just because the US is out or because trends are bad, there's none. But as Maury Olmsfeld and I have talked about in some work we did related to the G20 over the last couple of years, there's you have to have a more modest and targeted view of what's sustainable. We talk about mutually binding and beneficial changes in government behavior. This is, there's, there's a bunch of grapes out of reach and we together go get, the, go get the ladder and one of us holds the ladder or both of us go up and take turns. The simultaneous contributions to a common goal or simultaneously agreeing not to do something. What, what is, seems to us, and I'll speak for myself, seems to me doomed to failure are attempts to do what was tried in 78 or 85, where you have these comp complex complementary deals that Japan or Germany raises their fiscal policy while the US tightens their fiscal policy. And then at some later point, we switch around 
That I think is due to failure. Now we have a number of examples of successes of this type. Um, the Vienna Initiative and the G20 deal on trade during uh, the financial crisis a decade ago, the currency agreement between China and the G7 that's been abided by, and very relevantly recently, the 2020 central bank swap lines and the plurilateral vaccine PPE agreements, which were insufficient, but which were helpful. Anyway, I raise this not to say that this is going to reverse the growth concerns I have that come out of deglobalization or not deglobalization, excuse me, the corrosion of globalization. But I raise this just to say that we should not give up hope on things like climate change or public health, that those can go on, even if the growth aspect of international cooperation is poor. I think this becomes a policy issue that governments have to deal with if we assume that the US and the People's Republic of China are likely to become increasingly unreliable in international commitments after the next couple of years. I think historically, the US adherence to international commitments was pretty unusual. Um, there's a whole literature in international political economy, many of you are aware of, talking about can you do things without a hegemon? I think the answer is yes, but we have to look at an international system that is more modular, more resilient to inconsistency at a minimum from the US, if not withdrawal or bullying from the US and China. I've spoken about what I'll call principle plurilateralism, um, less reliance on overwhelming these big international institutions, more on deals. Obviously, the Nordhaus clubs on climate are a similar kind of approach. I think it is possible, going back to where I started, to take advantage of the mistaken political salience of trade and heavy stuff to focus on making progress and trying to retain ties of the other the other layers of globalization's fabric. So this is to say, like Carmen and I'm not ending on a hopeless note. Um, I just, I do think that as we figure in our growth projections for the next few years, the corrosion of globalization, largely driven by accelerated US withdrawal has to be taken into account. Thank you very much.